everybody, Ben Jennings here, and we are on session number eight in our study on in the book of Acts, the first half of the book of Acts, and today we find ourselves in chapter six, and we're covering the whole chapter. Uh, this particular lesson um, talks about um, what happened in the local churches. It was growing, that church there at Jerusalem. Um, there were um, some things that happened, and there was a uh, response that the church had um, when a local church is being faithful to God, there's a likelihood of uh, growth. And as there is growth, both spiritually and numerically, there are um, these possibilities that come up. And so um, what I put as our objective statement for the lesson is that whenever a local church is being faithful to God, there's a likelihood of three reactions to growth happening in the life of that church. The first one is that opportunity knocks. There are opportunities um, that happen. And I love um, how that uh, this is uh, this is seen as an opportunity. This is something that um, may seem as a problem, but often, often opportunities come dressed as problems. That's what goes on here. It says in chapter 6, verse 1, And in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. And then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, "Now, so here we have um, Grecian. Uh, these are people who are Greek speaking, um, often Greek speaking Jews, um, who are upset with the." Uh, Hebrews, the Aramaic speaking Jews, because the perception was, and actually it says their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. It seems as if um, that this particular problem that they encountered was something that um, probably most likely was not um, was not uh, intentional. It may it may have been intentional, but it doesn't seem like that's what it is. Um, you know, whenever you're doing ministry. Uh, when you don't have um, the right processes and the right leaders, people can slip through the cracks. And so um, even with the right processes and the right leaders, people can slip through the cracks. And that's what's going on. Um, these groups of people, there was obviously maybe some language barriers. There was maybe some um, cultural barriers, some background differences. And so real or perceived, um, there were some, there was some neglect going on and it was creating murmuring uh you know what murmuring is it's it's um bordering on grumbling complaining um concern that could become there could be legitimate concern sometimes legitimate concern becomes complaining and gossip and so you've got all this going on so the 12 the the 12 disciples that would have included the 11 apostles that, G that were with Jesus, plus Matthias, who was also with Jesus and was added to their number, they came together and they kind of came up with a, a plan. It says in verse 2, it is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. You know, we learned a few weeks ago as we studied the book of Acts that um, after those that were receiving Christ were baptized, their pattern was that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, breaking of bread and in prayer. And so the uh, the apostles were driven by that great commission work, and they were driven to help lead uh, leaders in um, praying and studying the Word of God and teaching the doctrine. And those people that were believing that, preaching the Word of God, those people that were getting saved were, were um, doing that. They had been invested in for three years with Jesus, and they knew they needed to invest in other people. And so it didn't make sense if everybody can help out the widows and the orphan, orphans of daily ministration, but only some can preach. It makes sense that you get those who can uh, serve to serve and those who can preach to preach. And that's what they're saying. It doesn't reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report. So character still mattered, even though, even though this is a, a difficult, um, I mean, even though this is not, I say not difficult, this is a, a task that um, uh, is um, 
uh, something that's a little bit more universally uh, able to be done, they still wanted people that had good character, full of the Holy Ghost and the wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer to the ministry of the word. So here's an opportunity. And what's amazing about this opportunity is that um, the disciples would be given more holy to what they um, were good at. And that is pouring into people, praying, the ministry of the word, uh, discipleship, those kinds of things, evangelism. And then people, you know, people grow through service. They grow by serving. And so there are people that um, that they said, hey, let's get people who can serve to serve um, in this other way. Um, and so this was an opportunity for the church to expand what they were doing. Jesus did this with the disciples. They weren't the one preaching um, on the hillside when the, when the feeding of the 5,000 came. What did they do? Um, they didn't do the miracle. Jesus did the miracle. Jesus prayed. Jesus blessed it. Jesus did the miracle. Jesus was the one teaching before that. What did they do? They organized the people in the groups. They distributed the food, and then they cleaned up afterwards. That's what they did. Um, they literally served there probably wasn't any tables, but they were serving, right? They were giving and helping. And so uh, here you've got them um, saying, hey, this ministry that we're doing of the word and prayer is really important. And and I will say that, teacher, your your job in teaching the, the lesson is super important. Um, but so is taking attendance. So is uh, making sure the room's clean. So is um, making the phone call to that sick class member or that class member that was coming, but you haven't seen him in a while. The, the, uh, the, the job of, um, making, visiting the sick, the job of, um, um, organizing, um, the outreach, organizing, um, events where people gather and, and get connected. Those are all important things that happen in your Sunday school class as a church, um, making sure that people, are loved, making sure that people that are looking to um, get saved or join the church or looking for a class, that those good people get connected. Those are all really super important things. And so it's more ministry than any one person can do. And so they had to distribute that ministry and they were connect, committed to that. So this was an opportunity. It looks like a problem, but the problem made them think through how are we organizing the ministry? How are we organizing what needs to happen? The tasks, the the importance of it. And let's let's equip and let's uh, give over this ministry. And so what that led to, opportunity knocked, that led to number two, influence expands. Influence expanding. If you look at verse number five, it says, and the saying pleased the whole multitude. So this is something they proposed to the whole congregation, all the disciples, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. He's going to be interest, uh, very um, instrumental here later. F Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, and Timon, Parmenius, Ni and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, um, who they set before the apostles, and when they prayed, they laid their hands on them. It's kind of interesting here that um, as this happened, um, they, um, when they chose these people, of course, the people that looked like they were being um, neglected were the Grecians. All of the names here are Greek names. And in fact, it says Nicol Nicholas was from Antioch, which we know um, is in that direction. And so um, obviously not quite in Greece, but um, he was not a Hebrew. He is a foreign. He's a, a foreign guy, a proselyte. And so, interestingly, these are probably all Greek-speaking people, and uh, they. My, my point is, they looked for people who had gifting, looked for people who are faithful, and now you don't just have the apostles doing work; you have the uh, you have the people doing work, the disciples that are growing. And it's interesting. A lot of times, people start with serving tables, but they lead to doing more than that. So once they kind of identified them. Then they prayed for them. They laid their hands on them, which is a, a, a uh, the image of, hey, we we are supportive of these people. These are people that God's using. 
And so what was the result of all of that? Verse 7, the word of God increased. Well, why do you think that is? It's because the people who were stewarding that were doing that. The, the people were more receptive to the word of God because people were being taken care of. The numbers of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. This is amazing. People who understood the Old Testament um, were being pointed to Jesus, and and God was doing that. That's what happens when the Word of God increases. It's, it gets proclaimed, and as disciples are made um, by the Word of God and planted into their hearts, um, they they evangelize, and that's what's going on here. Pretty amazing. So you have this opportunity, Knox. You have influencing, expanding, and one of those guys that got named was Stephen. Apparently, he's growing through all of this, and then it says in verse eight, his his abilities begin to expand. And but we see number three, opposition happening. That whenever there is um, a right response to challenges. When you look at those challenges as opportunities, as you begin to do the right thing and 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 do the ministry the way you're supposed to, oftentimes Satan doesn't like that, and uh, other people may not like that, and so now we see opposition happening. Verse eight: Stephen, of full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines and Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia and Asia disputing with Stephen. Here's a bunch of people um, who think they understand the Bible, who think that uh, Stephen's wrong, and they just argue with him. Here's Stephen, who's demonstrating himself to be from God, doing these great wonders and miracles, and people did not like him. They didn't like the message he was giving. Verse 10, they, they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. I love that. They couldn't, they could not uh, challenge his doctrine so they got to the place where like, okay, he's got the miracles going on. God's obviously with him. He's saying the he's saying things that uh, a message that um, comports with the word of God and is challenging us. We got to get him to stop. Verse eleven. Then they suborned men, which said, "We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God." These are people that they. Um, Suborn, kind of an interesting word. The word suborn there, um, I'm looking it up here in real time. Um, to cast under, to suggest, to instigate, to throw in stealthily, that is to introduce by collision, uh, to instruct privately, instigate, to bribe or induce someone unlawfully or secretly to perform some misdeed or to commit a crime. The uh, Greek word is Hupabalo. So um, basically they bribed some people. They they got some people to say, to make up a story. When you're doing the right thing, sometimes people even, I, I spoke with a leader this week that, that kind of let me know that that's what happened in the situation they were in. And it's so sad. We need to pray for our leaders because an accusation for some people is a, is a, uh, is a, uh, a sentence. Anyway, verse 12, and they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council, set up false witnesses, which said, the man seeth see not to speak the blasphemous words against this holy place of the law. For we've heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council were looking steadfastly, steadfastly on him and saw his face as it had been a face of an angel. Here you've got Stephen. He um, had been used of the Lord as a deacon, helping out people. So, someone here given over to um, the ministry of helps, service, and then that led him to having a ministry of the word, which is what happens as people begin to serve and then they grow. That often happens, and uh, they run into this opposition. And you'll see in the next chapter that he ends up having an opportunity. And, of course, he ends up getting getting uh, stoned. I, I kind of think it's hilarious that in this season in which I'm trying to recruit um, some new deacons that we're going to have a lesson that says, hey, there's opposition that can happen if you become a deacon. 
Um, if you begin to work and serve in the church, there may be some opposition to that. Uh, what's interesting, though, is that the scripture um, does say um, that there is um, a value to becoming a deacon. Um, there are qualifications for it. First Timothy 3.8. Um, one of two sets of qualifications given to Paul. There's the qualifications of an overseer, um, which is used, that's a bishop, which is used interchangeably with the word uh, uh, pastor and elder, um, three terms for the same office. You have the qualifications also of deacons, and he lists those out. The deacons was a grave, not double tongue. It goes on, let the deacons be the husband of one wife, Verse 13, for they that have used the office of a deacon well purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. This certainly was true of, of um, Stephen, um, and he definitely was bold. We'll see that. Um, but God was using um, him, and sometimes even in the opposition, the opposition to the church in the early part of the um, the early church, and this has been a pattern throughout the church, it actually was um, healthy for the church. Obviously not healthy in the sense that people died, but healthy in the sense that those who committed to the faith were genuine. You don't, they were sincere. You don't die for and are persecuted for something that, that you don't really believe in. And, uh, and, it often seems that the more um, persecution happens, th there was a saying that some, I don't, I don't know who coined this phrase, but it says the blood of the martyrs, Stephen's the first one, the blood of the martyrs watered the ground that grew the church. And uh, in, in a theological way, I don't, uh, you know, that you could take that the wrong way, but in a practical way that, that really did happen. People, um, people want to be a part of something real and God was at work. And so um, whenever a church is being faithful to God, there are going to be problems that can become opportunities. There are going to be influence. There's going to be often seasons where influence expands because of how you take these opportunities and use them and disciple people into service that leads them to being, to growing into other kinds of leadership and as that happens and as the church grows and as its influence expands there are people who oppose and it's called that that people have to be strengthened and grow to where to be able to stand that opposition the thing that we're doing in the local church in reaching people discipling people sending people out to um, minister a great great commission ministry all of that is um is so important and it's it's not tasked to corporate america it's not tasked to the business world it's not tasked to um to uh, the government um it's tasked to the local church and so i hope this lesson helped you um we we could have seasons of this with the sunday school class we can have these same uh, seasons uh, with a church as a whole. And uh, so the question, how do you respond? You know, what problems are you looking at as problems rather than opportunities? Are you looking to explain, expand uh, the influence of uh, your church as it, in your Sunday school class as you're trying to impact people? And then um, do you have any opposition and how are you facing it? Um, those are great questions that you can wrestle with as you apply this lesson to the people in your class. Hope this helped. Have a great day and enjoy session number eight.